Stanford University. All right, why don't we get started? All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Steve Marmon. Um, I, um, I, I was invited here today to talk about uh, the iPhone user interface guidelines. I'm going to talk about that, but in a broader context, in, in sort of the larger process of how you actually make an iPhone application that doesn't suck. So, and I'm in 10 easy steps, so it's nice and, it's nice and straightforward. So just a little bit about myself before uh, I start out. Um, I grew up in a remote corner of Alaska, um, did my undergraduate work in the University of Montana, and now I'm here with the Stanford HCI group getting my master's degree. And um, I also work at the design school as well. And so if you want a little bit more information about me, um, you can check my website, although it's horribly out of date. So you better to like look, check on Twitter if you want to um, see what I'm actually up to. But that's. That's kind of enough about me, and um, kind of back to the actual topic at hand. Um, so like I said, I was originally asked to talk about the, the HIG, and the HIG is a wonderful document, and all of you should read it. Um, but the problem with the HIG is it generally kind of focuses on, you know, here's this control, here is, you know, here is where it should go on the screen, here is how many pixels it should be from another control. And it's very, very low level, and it's very useful when you're developing an application to reference the HIG. Um, However, like if you're just kind of starting out and you kind of want to know more in general, like how should I just build, you know, like what app should I build, how should I build it, what's the, what is the process, um, it's, it's kind of a little bit too narrow and specific. So I kind of want to talk about sort of the broader, this broader process. And um, it's going to be kind of informed by um, sort of the design process that um, I have learned both in, in, in sort of like through my HCI um, cu curriculum as well as working at Apple and then uh, this last summer on doing iPhone development, as well as um, working at the design school, which is affiliated with a product design firm called IDEO. So a lot of this is very kind of D school slash IDEO-ish, and also with a lot of kind of uh, tips and tricks pulled in from what I learned at Apple. So that's kind of a little background of where, where, this, kind of, where this process kind of comes from. And so um, as I'm sure all of you know there are great apps on the App Store, like last week. We heard from uh, Lauren, who came to talk about Tweety. And um, Tweety, and Tw Tweety is one of these examples of the, these apps that came on the store. It doesn't really have a, a ton more features that other apps, the other Twitter apps didn't have on the store. But it, it completely dominated as now the best-selling uh, Twitter app on the store, even though it actually costs money, while the majority of the rest of them are free. And, um, and then there are other apps which kind of exist in spaces where like, there isn't even a lot of competition, and yet they still like, sell horribly and have not, have not made a lot of um, inroads. And so the difference here um, you know, is, of course, the user interface to a huge, to a huge degree. And um, so like, how is it that you get to you know, the, the one on the left rather than the one on the right? And so um, that's kind of what I'm going through today. So the first step of this process. Oh, and also, sorry, I should have mentioned this earlier. If you have like questions or like or interject, just put your hand up. Like it's not. I mean, I, we, you can stop, or there'll be time for questions at the end as well. So feel free to interject if you'd like. But um, the first step is um, first kind of deciding. Well, what do you build? And this might seem kind of silly, like oh, I have my idea. Um, but a, 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 a big problem is that a lot of people start with the solution. Like they might they might think, oh, well, you know. I want to build a like, location-aware social network on the iPhone. And it may seem like a great idea, but it, it may not be clear, like, what, like, what, why are you building this, this social network for? Like, what, what, is the, what is the solution that it's solving? Um, is it because you, you notice that your friends you know, have a hard time coordinating for you know, places to eat, to get, you know, to get dinner or something? And if that's the case, that's the need that you saw, then maybe there's a better solution than just kind of this, this more generic idea that you have. And so, what you need to think about when you're like very starting off the process is first of all, who is the user that you're actually trying to build this this software for? Um, and often, and, you know, and oftentimes it's too easy to kind of just think, oh, I'm building it for everybody, but it's impossible to build software for everybody. So you have to pick a particular person, a particular very very narrow user group, of who you're actually going to build, build your software for. And then also, what is the problem that you're trying to solve with it? And, and you know, it seems obvious, but this is where you need to start before you jump off to the, solu the solutions. And um, if you really want to, if you want to have a slide, you know, for sure have a success, successful app, the, the best way to go is you say, user equals you, problem equals your problem. And, and th this, is, this is like the guaranteed path to success. Because 
you know, if you're actually, because if you're, if you're, you are the user that you're building this app for, then you know what your needs are, you know what features you want, you know what you're going to use, you're not going to use, and you can have this sort of immediate feedback loop as you're developing it, and you probably even use the app while you develop it. Um, and this, this is, for example, what Lauren did with Tweety. He built Tweety for himself. He didn't build it for everybody. He built it for himself. And this is this is hugely important because it's extremely hard to imagine what other people might want, like much harder than you realize. And this is why like 80% of software projects fail, is because the developers don't really understand what the users actually want until it's all done, they put it in front of them, and it's like, oh, well, I didn't really need this, I needed this. And so if you can develop for yourself, that's, that, that's, the, the, that's the best way to go. However, if you, you might have a user, you know, some other user group that you know of that has a need, and you really want to fill that need. Like, maybe you want to build an app for grandmothers, and there probably aren't a lot of grandmothers writing iPhone apps. I'm sure there are some, but you know, maybe there's, there's, there's this need. You know, and, um, and so, how, so if you want to build for them, it's really important to, to go out and talk to those people, to go out and act, I mean, it's, you, you, one thing to imagine what they want, another thing to actually go out to them and actually meet them. And what you really want to do is you want to create something like this. Like you want to create, you want to create a persona of who is this user that you're building this app for? If it's not yourself, who are they? And it can be sort of, it doesn't have to be a real person. It can just be, you know, this sort of this stereotypical, you know, made up person. It's kind of a, a sort of a culmination of people that you've met or people that you know and what they're like. And, and then you should make this up and say, like, you know, say you're building it for grandmothers and you're making it for, you know, Jane is a grandmother. She lives in Michigan. She has three grandkids in California. And, you know, she loves to, you know, to draw pictures with them. It's her favorite thing to do when they come to visit. And so, but now they're, they're, she's far away and so she wants to have this interaction. You know, she, she misses them, so she wants this interaction far away. So if you, like, make this and you, like, staple this above your computer, like, every point in the process, you can think, well, sh you know, should I add a feature for sharing this on Facebook? And you might think, well, I don't, Jane doesn't actually have Facebook. Maybe this isn't such an important feature for this application. And so it really helps to kind of narrow things down as you're developing. So, so I'm going to have sort of like these principles that I'm kind of like going to espouse at every step along the way. And so the first principle for like this first initial step is know your users. And if possible, make, that, make the user yourself. So once you have an idea for your app, and this is kind of, I guess, kind of, you're sort of at this phase right now, you're going to be moving into building your, your like, three-week project soon. Yeah. So you're kind of here, and soon you're going to be, you know, moving, moving beyond that phase. And so the first thing you might want to do is, well, you know, not, not, now I know what my, I'm know what my user is, and what my, the, you know, the, the problem is, and now I'm going to start coding the solution. And that's not what you want to do. You know, it's much too easy to jump the gun and, and start developing before you actually really have a solid idea of how to go about doing this. And so the first thing I recommend that you do is visit the App Store. Because one thing, it's surprising how often people write apps that have already been written and been written really well. Um, so there's that. But in addition to that, um, there's, there's a lot of, um, like, on, on the iPhone, you don't have the opportunity to really teach the user very much, like new interactions or new designs or new ways to use programs, because pe people have very limited you know, attention spans. People have very, like, very limited patience for your application. Most applications, far and away, are never used more than once. So if you're actually going to try and make an app, if you want an app that people can immediately learn how to use, you want it to be similar to what they already have used. You know? So you want to, you want to you know, you, for one thing, you want to look on the App Store and see what the popular apps are on the store. And, you'll, and, and see how they work. And, you'll, and you want to look at you want to look at the Apple apps as well that are on your phone already. Because it's, you might, like, it's really easy to like, just think, oh, I know how iPhone apps work. But then when you sit down to actually to do it, you're like, oh, wait a minute. Like, what is, when is this control actually really used? And, and you know, like, is it really OK if I have like, 16 levels of you know, view controller tables? I mean, and so looking at what other apps do will help you tell you know, a lot about like, what, what people are doing and like, what people expect from applications. And in addition, uh, you, you also, um, has helps me to get the risk that you might reinvent the wheel in terms of certain aspects of your application. Like, for example, say you wanted to go and have a graph in your application that, you know, that the charts some metric over time. Um, there aren't any Apple apps, except for the stocks, that has that. But even the stocks isn't, isn't really an interactive version of that control. So you may not really, so you may think, well, I, I could, you could sit down and, like, actually, like, you know, sketch out and think about it really hard and how should I work and how should panning work and do you zoom on these things and, I think there's a lot of things to think about, but the fact is that, that graphing is a kind of a, you know, it's, it's, it's not like completely specific to your problem, and there's probably other apps on the store that actually that do this as well. So, if you've got, so you, what you want to do is you want to go out and look at other apps and find other, what other people have done, and, 
and, and see, you know, and they, they've probably gone through the process, all this process of figuring out how it should work, and they've put it in front of users, and they've, iterated, and they've gotten feedback from users and what they did wrong, and they've fixed it. And so th there's a lot of knowledge out there just free for the taking um, that you can get. And so you know, it comes on this, this axiom, you probably, oh, sure. Yeah, so the question was, what about being sort of psyched out by other apps being on the market? And I mean, you shouldn't take this as if there's already an app out there, you shouldn't go forward. I mean, you know, if, if there's apps out there and you are not satisfied with them, then there's something that's missing. And there are peop other people probably like you that also are missing those same features from those applications, or they don't like the way the application works in the same way that you do. So you, you, sh you, know, so it, it, you shouldn't be completely turned off by that. But there's often, there a lot of times there's cases where like, you just hadn't really looked hard enough and there actually is a great app that you might actually like. So there's definitely, like, there, there's, there's some apps for which it's easy, there's, there's switching costs. So like with Twitter, it has a very low switching cost. You can just type in your username and password to another app and it's really easy to switch. There are other apps, like maybe your, your, like your weight tracking application, where they've already entered their weight every single day for the last 200 days. And so it, like those apps are going to be a little bit harder to, um, to kind of break into the market with, because people are already established, like with, with existing apps. But even so, the app store is growing, and it's still at a phenomenal rate. And app sales aren't selling down. So there's all kinds of new users pouring in that are going to be looking at your app for the first time. And so if there's something special and unique that's different <laughs> than your app than what's already there, you can still, you still have a good chance of, of, still, of coming in even later in the game. So you shouldn't be completely, you know, totally psyched out by those people. Um. Mm -hmm. but, um, so you hear the 200 uh, Twitter app, uh, and you show the most popular ones first. Yeah, so, so, I mean, so it, I'm not saying it's not necessarily going to be easy. So even like Tweety, it, it, it took like, like reviews by, by relatively, um, Important people on the internet to go and you know and like help other people find it. So it's it is so if you can find a unique niche, that, that, then you're more likely to you know have, to have a success. You know it, it, it is. It's not, I'm not saying it's not going to be any less hard, uh, but you're going to have to like re rely on more than just you know the, the you know, what's released this week list to probably to be successful. Yeah, question back there. Or no? Oh, sorry. Michael, any more questions? All right, cool. So I'll, I'll, so continuing. So yeah. So like there's this. There's this wonderful quote, good artists copy, great artists steal. It means it doesn't mean that you should like steal other apps' designs or ideas identically, but you should kind of build on the, build on the, sh like, you know, the shoulders of, of others and, and um, you know, not, you know, like where, where other interactions have been sort of established on the store, you know, and like, other apps have done them, make sure you follow those conventions so users are familiar with them. So yeah, don't build your app in a bubble. Look around before you actually move forward. Um, so the, the third step so is, is now you want to sort of explore the space of solutions for your application. And so you, you might like think, oh, well, I, you know, I could just jump in at your first solution. You'll, you'll really want to just do that. Like you think it's really great. And I always think my first solution is really great. And I love it. And I don't want to, you know, depart, depart from it. But, but it's never the best. Like even the best designers I knew at Apple, all, you know, they, they, their first designs were always awful in comparison with what they came up with eventually. Like you'll, you'll get better with your, your first design the more projects you develop. But especially when you're in a new domain like iPhone versus a desktop, it's, it's much harder to kind of get in the mindset of how you develop for this new, um, this new platform. So it's really important to explore a lot of different solutions. And, and as you do this, you want to think about have a few constraints in mind. Um, of course, the iPhone has a small screen. So you, you, can, you want to think of what, what is iPhone sized data? Like what, 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 you, what data you might use on the desktop, you know, you're going to have to sacrifice some of it probably to, to really make it available on the phone. So you want to think, what, what, what is it that people are actually going to need on a small screen? What are they going to need on the go? Um, that, and and what, what can you throw away? Um, in addition, you, the iPhone is much, has much less precise input than you're going to have on the desktop or, or a lot of other mobile platforms. So you, you have a finger, and you, you, you know, this is, it's a much more blunt, uh, you know, it's more blunt acquiring target. So you can, it, they need to be about 44 pixels big to actually, to actually hit a, a target on, on the phone. And that's much larger than buttons that you're used to making. So you want to keep this in mind. You know, people, people tend not to like to type on the iPhone. I mean, it, it, I'll say that it's worse than other mobile devices, but it's still kind of a pain to actually type on you know, this little small cramped keyboard. And, um, and so as a result, you want to orient your application. I mean, most applications, as a result of this, are oriented towards consumption rather than production. So you, you read things versus writing them. And so it's not to say that apps aren't successful at writing. Like there's, there's Birdhouse, there's this wonderful Twitter app that's very successful, um, or relatively successful considering how niche it is, but it's only for writing tweets. You can't even read them. And so there's clearly an, a, you know, a use out there for, um, uh, for like production uh, applications, but, but generally that tends to be a lot less of the case. And, and finally, people tend to use iPhone apps in very short bursts. 
So the average F1 app is used for less than five minutes at a time. Most of, the, most of those are still used less than one minute at a time. And so the, these very, very short, inter, short interactions. So you, trying to think, keep that in mind, you don't want to build a process that takes a person a really long time to go through. They, they may lose interest and leave your application, or just not, not, or just not even lose interest. They might be on the subway and have to like, get off the subway. You know, it's their stop, so they don't, have, they, don't, they don't have time. So you need to keep these in mind. Um, however, there's also affordances as well that the iPhone affords that you don't really get on other platforms or that you may not be used to developing for. You know, you have multi-touch and, you know, and accelerometers and GPS that you're all familiar with. Um, it's important to keep in mind that users often aren't as familiar with these. They aren't as accustomed to using accelerometers as input, and so this requires a little bit more, um, this requires a little bit more training um, on, on that part. But there are really, aside from all of these, the most important thing to keep in mind is that you're building this for a particular user. And so as you're exploring this space, keep in mind all the time who's that, who, you know, who that user is that you're building this for. Um, so you don't kind of wander off too far with like weird features that are not really related to what you're going to be building. Um, and ultimately, as you're doing this, you, you want, this, this should be your goal, right? You know, you, your goal is not to stuff as many features in as you can possibly fit. Your goal is to actually as, many, as, as few as you can that still achieves what you want to accomplish. Um, and so, like that app we showed at the very beginning that had like 72 buttons on one screen, you know, clearly they could have done with some fewer there and they might have been more, a little bit more successful. Um, and an example of this is, is iPhoto. So, iPhoto on the desktop is this, you know, full featured application, you know, it has faces and places and you can edit and does all this stuff and it's great. Um, and you look on the iPhone and you can look at pictures and you can delete pictures. And it doesn't mean it's unsuccessful. Like it's very successful of an application. Anyone can use it. Like little three-year-old kids can figure out how to use this application. It's so minimal because there's not like there's not like 400 buttons cluttering the screen that they could they could hit by accident or have to parse out. And so, um, really, like finding this minimal set of features that 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 I mean, it's not, it's not so minimal that you're like people stop using the app because it's missing the features they need. But as the, the, that balance, it's a hard balance to strike. And, and how you get there is through a lot of brainstorming. So that's, so then the principle here is to, to be minimal um, in, in this exploration phase. Uh, once, you're, once you're done with that, you need to get your ideas down on paper. And so, um, so you need to sketch. And so before you can get like to this app on the, I guess it's your right, you need to start out with this sort of this sketch on the left. Yep, sure. Yeah, yeah. So, the question was, when being minimal, how how do you, like, it's hard because you can think of new features. Yeah, and how do you how do you narrow down? So, and so, yeah, how, how do you narrow down to this minimal number of features? And so, um, one thing one thing that is, is, is uh, that helps when doing this is if you have a very specific user, you can figure out what are the minimal features that this user needs. Like you can imagine other users might want other features, but if you can think like if you can if you can keep narrowing and narrowing down your user group that you're targeting to, I mean, this very specific user, you can build a, it's better to build a great app for a tiny number of users than to build an app that's kind of sort of half okay for a lot of people. And then like, no one really wants to use it because it's not that great. But if you get a small user group that likes it a lot, you can always expand from there once you get, so you get feedback. And so it's narrowing in on a particular user group is really useful in, in that process. And also, as will come up, coming up in, like, soon, like, actually putting, these, putting your sketches and designs in front of users will help you figure out which ones people sort of miss and which ones they really like, they, they, they look for and they cannot find because they really need them. And so um, a, lot of this, a lot of this is going to be sort of you know, via feedback loops as well. So, um, and so in terms of, of sketching, um, the, uh, so the, the, once you're sketching here, you, know, you, might, you might once again be tempted to sketch one design and be happy with it. You know? If you've gone through a lot, of, a lot of brainstorming, you have an idea of your features, you probably have some idea in your head how it will look like. And, um, and so you, you want to create your design. So you, you sketch out your feature, you, you sketch out your design, it's great, and it's wonderful, and you're happy. But the fact is that it's pro almost certainly not the best way of designing your application. And, and also, it may have this, have this fact, like it may have features that users don't need or ones that are missing, and it's hard to, to know. So what you really want to do is sketch a few more. You know? Like if you have three versions, and they have slightly different features and slightly different layouts of things, then you, you, then, and then you have, you've explored a little more of the space. If you do a few more, you've gotten even more. But the, and then if you do like 10 of them, you've, like, you've probably gotten a lot of the feature space right there. And in fact, this is a, this is a technique used at Apple, is, is this sort of, you know, create 10 alternative designs at the beginning. And the idea is that creating one, idea, one, idea, one design is easy. Creating three designs is also pretty easy. Five gets kind of harder. 
you know, and like seven is getting really hard. And then those, those last three are like impossible to think of new ideas. Like you're trying to like, whatever, I think of any ways you can vary this interface and you're like running out of ideas. But it's these last three that are really valuable, like where the really like creative sort of sparks come from. And you, like, you can try these crazy ideas and, and maybe they, and they may not work, they may, maybe they do. Um, but there may be, some, there may be some, some portion of them that you can retain as part of the final design. And so, and so by, by pushing yourself to think of it is at the beginning, you can, you can and, then, and, then, and then showing these to users, you can help figure out, yeah, the question? Hmm. So the question is, is there, is there a good tool for laying things out? And um, I'll actually be I'll talking about tools very soon, so I'll come to your question. Um, so yeah, so what you, what you want to do here is you want to use, you want to like leverage other people to help figure out what, 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 what these, what, which, which of your sketches, which of your sort of ideas that are sketched out are the best. And ideally you want to go to your actual, like if, if there's a user group other than yourself and your friends, you want to go to them. If you can't, even going to your friends is still going to be really, really useful. And so what you, you, you can do then is you can begin to narrow things down. You can you know, you know, show it to people, you know, they, they can be like, oh, I, I, can't, I can't comprehend what's going on here, and I love this over here. You'll get, you'll get what, so much feedback, you know, more feedback than, than you have to do with, just by showing a few ideas to people. And you can narrow it down, and you'll probably end up with a few designs, usually, that you, you really can't, they're all kind of the same. You know, people disagree which they like better, they're really not clear which is the best. So you'll have a few kind of ideas for what the app should look like. And, um, and this is good. So now, now you've come, you, you actually come a long way from just one design. And so the, the principle here is um, quality through quantity. And um, it's kind of like, have you guys heard the, there's like this story of um, like the clay pots experiment. Have you guys heard this? No? So the clay pots, the, the, this experiment, um, I think it was actually here at Stanford, but it may have been somewhere else. And the idea was they, they, they took a class and they had half the class that was a pottery class and half the class was, was told that they would be graded on the, in the end, they, they could turn in one pot, and it would be, the, and, and like however good their pot was is how they'd be graded. And they could create how many pots they want in the meantime, but they really need to turn in one best pot. And, and that, that's what their grader depended on. And the other half of the class was told, we're gonna, be, we're gonna take all your pots and throw them on a big scale, and we're gonna weigh them. And however heavy it is, that's how much your grade is. And then they, at the end of the class, they, 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 they everyone, you know, like, so this one class just created like a ridiculous number of, of pots in the class, just created a few really, you know, they spent a lot of time refining. And in the end, they had independent judges come in, and, the, for, and as you probably guessed from this other study, the, the side of the class that actually just was rated on quantity actually had much nicer pots than the one that had, was, was, was on, graded on quality. Because they'd done so many pots, they learned how to make pots, they, they came through different techniques, and they learned you know, how, to make, how to make a good pot. And so this is very much the, the same exact principle that applies here. You know, it, it may seem counterintuitive, but just by creating a lot of designs, you'll actually get to the better design much faster. Um, so, once you've kind of done that, then you want to go on and like, well, now how do you evaluate this design? So you, once again, you might want to just code this. It's hard to, start, hard to like hold back and turn to coding, but this process doesn't really take that much time. You can do this in a few days. And it'll actually be, like there's this wonderful chart, which I, I, didn't, I couldn't find in time of this presentation, which showed like the cost of making changes in your design at each point in this phase, and that doubles at every phase. So like, it's twice as expensive to redesign a paper prototype than is a sketch, and twice as expensive to do these, like to actually redo code than a paper prototype. And so the more you, can, the more you spend time, the more time you spend on here fixing things, the much less time you'll spend actually down the road doing it, and, you, and it'll be much, you'll actually save yourself a lot of time in the end. Um, but so back, but back on to sort of what a paper prototype actually is. And so this is it. It's, it's just like a piece of paper, and usually there's like one piece of paper for each of your screens. And it's exactly drawn, exactly how the screen will be. Like your sketch might be kind of messy, you know, much on, on one piece of paper, and they're not like really, you know, it, it's kind of a haphazard collection of ideas. This is actually your application, but on paper. And, and the value you get here is that if you actually draw your application on paper and you do one page per screen, you can actually have users use your application before you've put 100 hours into encoding it. You know, you can actually put someone down and they can like, like say, okay, here you are, you've just opened my new Twitter app. You know, and, you know why don't you check your tweets? Or here, why don't you write a new tweet? And then they have to like tap where they think would happen and then you, you swap out the screens, so what actually would happen, and then you, they tap again. And it's really simple and it's pretty quick to do these. And you can, you can do a three of them, three, like, like a few of them, like three of them without a lot of time investment. Ask people to use them, and you'll find people, and people will get stuck, and people will be confused, and people will like things and not like other things, and you get much richer feedback here yet than you just get by showing them showing them sketches. Because they might say that sketch looks pretty, when they try and use it, then they might be still like they still get stumped at certain certain uh, points. And you can do really cool stuff. Like this is one actually created. I don't know if you can see it that well, this is actually an iPhone. <laughs> it's a really enormous iPhone. Someone in this class created this uh, prototype uh, a, a couple of quarters ago. 
And it was really useful. They were building a game on the iPhone. And they wanted to understand. They didn't really have a good idea how to make this game work right. And so they, um, they didn't really show like, how you should move pieces on the board. And they had all different ideas. And so they, they built this prototype. And on the back side, this, this, piece, this is a piece of paper that's kind of like you, they could slide it forward and back to pan the map. So, they, so as the game plays, the, the map kind of panned. And these little dots on there are little pieces, there's little metal dots, and they had a magnet underneath. And so those little dots were the locations on the map, and so they moved the magnet underneath to show that the, that how people were moving around on top. And it, it was these wonderful little things. And it, was, it, was, it didn't take them very long to put this thing together. But then they were able to play the game. And, you know, and it's a huge win to be able to play the game before you've written any lines of code. Um, and they learned, they learned a huge amount from it. And this was, it turned out to be a great project in the end. So, so there's that. And then the final, final really useful uh, um, thing you can do at the paper prototyping stage is you can kind of test these really tricky interactions that you're kind of not really sure about. So like, so one thing on the iPhone is there's a lot of sort of implicit interactions you can do. You can shake the device. You can turn, rotate the device. And there's all these things that you can might, that aren't really obvious. And determining if users actually will do those is, or is, is actually really important because um, we can make a big difference for your application. And so there, there's a few different like types of implicit interactions. There, and trying to figure out like how you how you should integrate them um, is is um, tricky. So you can you can try, for example, like there's this application called Waitbot, and they learned when, from their testing that they had to you know show little prompts and explanations of how to use this app because it wasn't as explicitly clear to the user. Um, Tweety, for example, Tweety has these implicit interactions, but they rely on kind of sort of discovery of it. You know, like you know, some people has happened to actually discover that they can do these kind of like they can swipe across and and find something. It's not clear they can. It's, it's, there's no like obvious thing that tells people that they can do that, but people can discover that they can swipe. And so these things are like these are some of these really tricky issues with iPhone programming. Like how do you how do you know if you're doing that or not? And um, paper, paper prototyping can help you figure some of these things out. So the principle here is fail early to succeed sooner. So you, you know, like through all these early phases, your idea is, to, is you, you, you know you're going to fail at some point along. Something's going to be not quite right. So you want to fail now rather than try to have to re, which rewrite a bunch of code later on. So now on to uh, your question earlier about tools. So so fire up tool. So this is the tool which I recommend. You can use Photoshop and there's other applications, but but my personal favorite is Omnigraphel, and it's really wonderful because. It's, um, it's kind of a vector, uh, it's, it's, really, it's, supposed to, it's supposed to be a graphing tool for like flow charts and things, but it's kind of morphed into this prototyping tool. And because there's all these wonderful like libraries of stencils that you can get. And like it, this, is, this is a one stencil set for doing iPhone development. Did you put the name up? It's called Omnigraphle. Yeah, the question is, is this a Mac software? And yes, this is, this is a Mac only software um, for doing graphing. So. It's it's really excellent. It's one of my most I, I can't like it's one of my most favorite apps of all time. Like I, it never leaves my it's dock. It's like Photoshop or something, but with templates. Yeah. So the question is, is it, is it like Photoshop? It, it's it's Photoshop is a sort of pixel based system. So like you can manipulate pixel the pixel level. This is more uh, this is more like you, you manipulate sort of these stencils and lines and boxes, and so it's more vector oriented, which is really useful at this level when you don't you know in it where you can just kind of, um you know you 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 don't like maybe not not completely. Um, like the gradients need to be flawless, like identical to what the final version will be, but you want it, all the elements can be on screen. And there's a question. Are the iPhone stencils add-ons, or is it, is it going to be satisfying? The question was the iPhone stencils add-ons. Yes, they are. There's a website um, called Graphletopia, just like that, or just like yeah, Graphle then Topia, or you should, you should search for Omnigraphle um, stencils online, and you'll find that this, this, this is one website. It's like there's like, one main website which has just tons of them, and there's actually three different sets. Last time I checked. Of iPhone stencils. This one's created by this one here was created by Yahoo, I believe. Um, I don't know if Yahoo even has applications on the store, but for whatever reason, they they, they created this this set. Um, but it's extremely useful, so you can very quickly drag and drop stuff. And it's actually and it, it's you, it's nicer than even than doing an interface builder because interface builder you kind of get sort of the default states of controls and things. But here you can get then you can get all these wonderful different like um, this one doesn't show it as much, but there's other one like here like the switches on and off things like that. Um, it's really, instead of having to like, you having to like set the stuff in code or fiddle with all the properties in interface builder, you can just drag and drop most of the states you can actually see in a final application, as well as you can you can integrate custom elements here too. So like I often use this with a tiny bit of Photoshop mixed in for the things that aren't exist that don't, don't actually exist in this toolkit. Whereas you, it's, it, that's more of a pain to do directly in interface builder, for example. And you can share this with people who don't have Xcode. So you, other people, you know, other designers, other people that you're um, working with. 
so I mean, so here's some. I mean, like these are these are a couple of screens I created using OmniGraphle, and they look almost almost identical to the final versions in the, app, the shipping application for one that I happen to be working on. And so um, you can do you can do like, and you can actually get like almost pixel perfect identical to what the final version will look like, which is phenomenal, which is really useful at this stage because after you've paper prototyped, you've gotten your feedback, you've kind of like got that down at that level. Now you want like now you want to know like. You know, will everything that I on my paper product actually fit on the screen? Like paper products, you know, there might be quite enough room for that button that you thought there was any room for, or there may be issues of um, like color issues that, that maybe didn't exist. Although 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 it's still one advantage of doing paper first is it's better to design in black and white before color, so that colorblind users don't have issues with your software. So that that you know, so if it, wor if it works in paper, it should also work here as well. But you can experiment with adding color to your application at this point as well. And also, if you're um, Working with multiple people, this makes it really easy to like. If you like a pixel perfect version of your application before you actually code it, then you can share that file with everyone, and then you can all work. And it's it, like the, the the communication overhead, just like is it, the, the, the uh, cost savings for that is, is phenomenal. Because when it's just kind of ambiguous, people have all different ideas uh, of how it should look. But if you have, it's like exactly like this, there's like and you do like every variation of every screen, then then it's much clearer when you're you're coding together what needs to happen. So I highly recommend that. So the, the principle here is be pixel perfect. Um, so now, so step seven is not really a step, but it's here to remind you that you, need that, that you don't just kind of go all through all this in like one quick shot. This is kind of an iterative process. And so you know, at various stages, you'll, you'll, you'll do a stage, and, you, and, and things don't really want have worked out, and the screen won't, you know, it's just not working, and you need to start over again. So sometimes you have to go back you know, to a previous, some previous steps and start back and stuff. So, like here's one screen that I was working on just a couple of days ago. I had this like idea of this mini. This, I thought, well, I want to do the signpost interface, and so I, I did this one. I liked it. I came back, looked at it a few minutes later. I hated it, so I did another version, and I spent like six hours going about different versions, and and it finally ended up with something I kind of liked. So I kind of iterated, you know, just on this one this one screen, um, and, and this same project at one point, I we actually were building this entire like the, we, the original idea for the project was had a phone plus a website, and we like we. You know, everything else was completely up through the omnigraphling stage. It was all completely like laid out and pixel perfect, and we actually thought we thought it, we thought it, we had it worked down right. And then we we started implementing it, and we realized like in our early 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 test that no one actually used the website at all. It just was complete like no one. It was no like people said they would, but they didn't actually really. And so we had to go back to the sketching stage again and start sketching over again and reimagine the application. So so the principle here is it, nothing is precious. You should you you know if you just kind of. It's it's hard to get to that sort of like distance yourself from your from what you, your work, but if you can get that ability of like okay, it's okay to throw it away, it's okay to start again. You know, you, you, if you, the more you if you if you're more the more you're comfortable with this, actually the faster you'll get app out the door, than if you're trying to hold out of things as long as you can until they like completely break a bit of testing and users are or they, or you release it and users give you, give you horrible reviews on the app store and no one buys your app. So. Which of those designs uh, worked best? I'm sorry, which one? Which one of these? Yeah, which one? Oh, did I, did I pick with? So, like, currently, it's the lower right-hand corner. This is the progression. Um, I actually, in the few days I've have left since I've left this, I've kind of begun to doubt the design. So I think I'm going to go back and do another round of it. Um, but this was this was actually the progression that I went come with the different designs that I. They're all kind of identical to the paper. Like the paper version was just merely the outline of this. But it was this, this, was, this was kind of really the look and feel on top of it. Other questions? So all of your graphics is also from OmniGraphle, or is that? Um, a large percentage, like, so for example, in this, so the question was, all, do all the graphics come from OmniGraphle? Um, a lot of them do. Um, some of them don't. So the wood was sampled from sort of like, from uh, samples I found online, and they're, they're not really perfect. They, they probably look better from back there than they do in the final, <laughs> than they actually really do, because they're just grabbed offline. Because I, I want to get filled with different types of like what wood, different wood textures would look like. So um, I, I actually often have another step after this, where I like, will go take, take this and then go into Photoshop and make it like really, really perfect. Um, although you can actually get really, like, it depends on the application. If you're trying to do something that has like a, that's really, like a really complex look and feel like this, then you want to do a Photoshop step afterwards. Think, like, to get to really make it exactly correct, and also don't, so you don't you know infringe on copyright by start building, st stealing someone else's wood texture from online, you know. So you'll need to like create your own version of that. Um, so, but I would say that for a lot of applications that stick with a standard look and feel, which I, I recommend, like I mean, like um, if, there, there, if you have to have a pretty good reason for going, you know, like a really like really custom look and feel, and um, 
And because it, it, sometimes, sometimes it can be like we're distracting and confusing to the users, and kind of like like this interface, for example, limits the amount of space, the amount of text you can have on the screen. On, norm, on a normal like list, you'll be able to have many more rows than you have here. It happens to be that for like the list of activities you might like perform this application, there aren't very many of them, so it's kind of okay to have a, have a, have a fewer displayed. Um, but this may not, may not be the case. So you want so for a lot some applications I've written or many of them, Omnigraphel is the, is enough. Like, and if there's using the standard controls, I don't really need to go to a sort of like additional Photoshop stage. Other questions? All right. So, so step eight. All right. Now you can finally code. So once this is pixel perfect, you know, I mean, and, and for the word, I don't mean that it doesn't change. It's still going to change. But now you finally know what you're going to do at last. So now you can you can move forward and code. And um, my recommendations for coding. I, I really don't know what this is actually a picture of. Really, like, I, I looked up MVC. Uh, and Google image search, this is what came up. So I thought it was kind of funny, and so I put it up. But uh, the, the idea here is, you know, like, in, in this class, you know, you're learning the, you know, the MVC design, sort of design paradigm, and it's, and it's actually really, really useful. Also, when you, you're trying to do good user interface design, is to really, really be mindful of that design pattern, because it, it abstracts away your, your views, and also your controllers, which are connected to your views, away from the underlying data and the back end stuff. And, the, and so the, what, what it allows you to do is it allows you to code your app from the top down. Like, I, I, like over many, like dozens and dozens of programs I've written, I like, have learned that far and away it's best to write the interface first and then the back end later data later. Because whenever I write the back end data thinking, oh, you know, I don't want to do interface stuff right now. It's too hard or it's just, I don't really feel like it. Let me write the back. I know the back end data isn't, I need to do it anyway. Let me just write it now because it needs to get done. Inevitably, whatever I wrote for back there actually change, like, it, it becomes irrelevant when the user interface changes again. You know, I find discover something else. And so I'm a big uh, proponent of top-down development, where you, know, you build the interface. And you actually can show it to people, have them play around with it. Like you have dummy data hooked up back in the back end. You know, the real database hooked up. You just have some flat files. And you can learn a lot. And then, then when you, you change the interface, you're just changing your little dummy data rather than re like, you know, changing all, this, all the, the columns in your SQL table. Or, or even worse, like rewriting all your algorithms in your complicated you know, back end system. So build from the top down. It will, it'll, so it'll save you pain. Um, especially when you're beta testing. So this is where you're going to get, like, you think you've done everything perfect up to now. And, and if you've done a good job the earlier phases, you shouldn't actually have any major revelations here. It, you, you've, you've already shown it to people already so, so many times that you should, that it should, the beta testing should go pretty smoothly. But inevitably, something comes up. And, and that's why it's better to have it, this, this clearer abstraction. And um, what you hopefully you should be getting at beta testing is just is minor, inter like minor interaction things, you know, little things. Like wording is a little bit funny that you didn't realize before, or there's some, or largely just bugs. Um, but what actually a bigger challenge when you are beta testing is who should be your beta testers. And so, my first recommendation is your friends because they're gullible and they will, th you know, and you can like they're nearby and you can like you know make them sit down and give you their UDID number from their phone and then provision it for their phone right then and there and you can get it on there. And so. Um, Definitely, even if your friends aren't your target user group, have them use your app because they will. Get, you're guaranteed to get some feedback from them. But it, but if you have an app which like it's hard to get lots of local users, um, I had a couple of apps like this. I did an earthquake analysis app, like a seismic app for seismologists, and there was like one seismologist on the campus, and there's like none of them for like hundreds of miles away. And so you know, it, 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 like for that, it, we, it, we had to like go like on, it, we had to go find other other means to, because like regular users didn't have enough domain knowledge to really know if it actually was good or bad of an interface. Um, if they, were, like, they, were, they didn't even know how to use it. And so um, a, great user, a great resource for this, less for seismologists, but more for other user groups, like, like um, you know, if you're doing this app for, like, um, for mothers and you're on campus, and there are a lot of mothers on campus or something, is to use Mechanical Turk. And are people familiar with Mechanical Turk? Some people? Okay, so for those of you who aren't, Amazon Mechanical Turk is a service where, there's, where people who are online who have nothing better to do with their time and there are tens and thousands of these people, or hundreds of thousands of these people, it's amazing, go on this website, and for small amounts of money, like often like five or 30 cents, or sometimes just a few dollars, they will perform some task. And so often, they, you know, and so often these tasks are like classified this image as, as one of these three things, or you know, so people, people use it for research projects all the time. I, I use it all the time for every project I do. I, I'm addicted to my clinical work right now. Um, but it's actually a great tool for recruiting beta testers if, 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 they, if you're like looking for ones that are kind of not immediately available to you. And you can put on, hey, you know, like if you, you know, 
to for people who have iPhone 3Gs and who are mothers and blah blah, you know, you sign up for this app and we'll pay you a dollar or two dollars to use our app for 15 minutes, you know. And, and if, if you just if you just need a small sampling like five or ten users, you can like for for ridiculously little amounts of money compared to normal testing, you can actually get users. And and they're usually it's really responsive. People usually do like you put the task up and people are on Mechanical Turk because they're bored looking for a task and they'll do it right away. You get this like wonderful, really fast response responses. And it's a little bit annoying because you have to like you have to actually provision your app for that person's UDID. So there's a little bit of like turnaround time. Um, but it, I've had nothing but really good experiences with this. And we've had like, and you do it, and an advantage is also, if these are your real users, all the times they ask you, can I, can I keep using this app after, you know, after the, the 10 minutes is done? And you say, sure. And they keep testing it for you for free for a longer period of time, because they want to use the app. You know? So you get this, like, it's this wonderful mechanism for recruiting people. And so I recommend it. Question? OK, so the question was, how do you actually give other users um, your application? And um, the process, so I don't know if you'll cover it in this class. You might, you might towards the end, but you're not going to cover it? Okay. So, so the process um, is called, it's called ad hoc distribution. And basically what happens is that, that they, they, they will give you their, their UDID. It comes from, uh, they either get it out of iTunes or they can install this little app that'll email the UDID to someone else. Um, it's called ad hoc helper. It's really awesome. And um, you tell them to like, hey, download ad hoc helper and send, send your, your UDID to this address and they do that. And then what you, what you do is you go on to your developer program portal account. Um, they, they, do, they have accounts on the developer portal? No. Okay. The okay. So since you're on the university program, you might not be able to do beta testing. Um, presumably, if you, you're in this class because you want to do like this more than just for this class, so then you get a real developer account. You can probably you'll, you'll, then you'll, you'll be able to do this. But basically, you go on the you go on the website. You enter their UDID and then it downloads a little file which you which you install in Xcode, which basically so which, which signs the program for that, that user's phone. So you have a list of exactly which phones um, they can be installed on, and every time a new person signs up, you have to go to the website, download this file again, add it in Xcode, and then you build you build your your uh, you build your program, and then you find the actual file on disk, the .app file for it, and then you mail it to them in the, in the email, and they drag it into iTunes, and iTunes will install it. It's a little bit cumbersome, but people are generally willing to like. You know, are generally willing to actually go through the hassle of doing it, especially if you like target people who actually really want the kind of application that you're trying to get them to, to use. So, other questions about that? Ask you answer your question about that. Cool. So yeah, so the principle here: test before you submit. Catch those, catch those small things, because because remember, you get to be on the new apps page once, and and if it you know go on there and has some horrible bug and people give you like. You know, some, or some obscure weird bug, which happens if, you know, I don't know, like, because they live in Europe and you didn't account for time zone differences or something like that, and you didn't think of it because you were testing only here or whatnot, then, you know, you make a bunch of horrible reviews and, um, you know, your, your app is sunk and it's hard to kind of pull out of that. So, so, you know, definitely do ad hoc testing before you actually release your application. And then release. Um, and th th this should be the you know hooray happy party. Although actually you have <laughs> it's not quite like that. It's gonna be like actually like worse for like a week because you're gonna be like responding to people that have issues um, with your application and, and um, you don't want to respond to them quickly so they don't get write bad reviews for you on the App Store. So it's not always quite as happy as this, but at least you're done with the first version. And of course you're gonna iterate. You're, gonna, you're probably gonna iterate and do bug fixes and release a new version. But in general, it, it it's kind of like this anyway. <laughs> so. I'm not going to cover too much more about like the release, the release and maintenance and all that kind of stuff. That's kind of a different topic. But that's kind of the um, the general the general flow of this entire process. And so like kind of the, the final key points I just want to like, reiterate again, just in case, is like make sure you talk to users. It's too easy as computer scientists, I, like myself included, to just not want to deal with that. Just write your code and stuff and think that you know what people want and, and you don't. No matter how good you are, like the best apples that, designers at Apple still don't completely know and they still have to talk to people, other people. Um, you know, explore a lot of designs. You know, it's, it, you know, it'll it a small amount of your time, and you're gonna get a potentially much larger investment over than than you'd get um, for j by just like you know spending a little bit more time coding and making things a little bit faster, and and iterate. You know, don't be don't the things precious. Keep keep iterating on your designs. So that's the presentation. Does anyone have questions? So the checkbox is actually um, replaced by the slider control. So it's back here in a second. So this control right here is the checkbox, this on off slider. And so um, the, the idea is the iPhone focuses on 
sort of um, more physical metaphors. So you, you know, like checkboxes aren't, it's not really clear how you check a box with your finger, but you can, the slide, so the idea is, the, that's why they chose the slider instead. But that's, that, are you talking about the step two one, the item two? Yeah, the item two, so. It, yeah, so, so that's, that's like a toggle, that's a, that's a radio button, more like a radio button as opposed to checkbox. Not necessarily. There are, so the question was, is, is this really like a checkbox, or is this actually like, like a radio button? And um, there are only two, like a checkbox, there are only two states can be in, on or off. Radio buttons allow you to have m uh, multiple states. So the option for, instead of for a radio button, often what you'll have is you'll have like a, a table view that, that, that supports checks, right? So, so you can click from, from multiple options, you can click one of them and it will check that option. So that's the sort of the radio button alternative. And this is the checkbox alternative for the phone. So the question is, is there any way to change the text on, the, on that? I, um, I think you might be able to change it to yes and no. I don't know if you can change it to any arbitrary text string. I've actually not. You can. You, you can change it to, other, to any, any, tec any text? Any yeah. OK, so you, all right, cool. So yeah, you can hit any, any text. That's, that's good to know. I've never, had, never actually needed to do that in any application I've done. OK, so the question is, well, these checkboxes over here. So, uh, on the web, um, so when you're, when you're in Safari on the web, you, uh, it, it uses the traditional con controls, including checkboxes and things. This is, this is for reasons of dimensions. So um, putting an enormous slider where the, the designer of the page is only allotted enough space for a little checkbox um, may completely screw up their design. So, in, in, so in, in this case, Apple does use traditional checkboxes and traditional radio buttons. It's kind of the suboptimal case, but that, it, it's the only case in the interface where you're not even allowed to use those in Interface Builder for the regular interface. Um, so I, so to, to, I've actually not submitted any apps. The question is how many apps have I actually submitted to the App Store? I have not submitted any personally. Um, I know people who have, and I work with them. And um, I, I finished up apps internally at Apple, which has a little different process. Um, so I'm familiar with the process, but I've actually not submitted them. Although I am submitting one in a few weeks, so I'll be going through it then. Yeah. So the question is, is the hard part drawing? Um, it, 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 there's a certain degree where, like, so I, I would say so there's a very, a very different skill set between like drawing to create art and drawing to just figure out what the layout should be. I, for example, am, very, am much better at just laying things out, like taking, taking these and moving them around on a screen than I am at creating actual art. I, I need help from other people for that, or I just think it takes me a really long time in Photoshop to do that. Um, and so, um, and there's many, many apps in the App Store for which there's really very, the only original art is maybe the icon. And all the rest is just pretty much choosing these. And, and there are some wonderful apps that I like. I, like, like as I mentioned, Birdhouse earlier. It's this great app. There's nothing like really, like no like fancy like, you know, graphics or things like that. You know, it, it's just a matter of using these, these existing controls. And so for doing that, like, you, you don't have to be an artist to sketch that out. You, you, you know, I mean, it, like, it doesn't matter how horrible your sketches are. Like mine, no one else would come, hardly understand. I have, to, I have to either explain them to people because they're so incomprehensible, um, which is OK at the sketching stage. You know, at paper prototyping, you have to be a little more neat. It takes a little bit more time to do that. But you, I would never say you have to be an artist to be to actually develop iPhone apps. Okay, so the question is, is like, what about implementing, like, what, what about implementing your, your ideas that you're realizing your ideas? Um, yeah, like, do, do, do you mean in terms of like coding or in terms yeah, of like, like, like you can't actually get there. You can't. You're, you're struggling to actually realize your, your design ideas. Okay, so what what, what if it is you, you design an application you don't I can't actually code it. Um, so it's one of those situations where you have to, you know, there's a few, there's a few options. Um, one thing is, well, maybe you picked up too broad of a, of a, of a, of a task or too, too you know, uh, your task is, is just too, is maybe it's just too, it's too much for you to code in the time. And, and there's all, you can almost always take a smaller slice of what you've done. Now, maybe it's a little more, less relevant to all users, but you can take a smaller slice. Um, it may, if, it's, if it's like you're trying to like do some complicated AI thing with it, well, it can't really help you there. You can recruit someone from the AI department or maybe you can, Write a different application. You know, if that requires something like that, then then, then you may have to pick a sub a suboptimal design, but one is like within your constraints. Because you're always going to have constraints, right? Like you, like you might write this great application, but it requires you know your iPhone to be three times as big as it is. Well, there's nothing that's really going to happen there. So you have to keep these constraints in mind. And and like, like I I think that like I personally don't think that there's like really anything that is so hard to code on the iPhone that you know you couldn't figure it out with a little bit of time and effort. There's there's nothing that's like. Like you're not going to be like writing compression algorithms and stuff. Like almost anything, anything you want to do, it's either been done already. Like you can download a library for some complicated algorithms, or you could probably figure it out with enough time. Um, um, so, question: are, are there any open source code repositories for like open, for like table views and things? 
Um, I know GitHub has some stuff. I don't, I don't know if it has just like regular course with snippets on it. Uh, there's some there's some open source applications. Um, Google code. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, like coders. There, there's, there's a number of just search engines, which some of them have iPhone code on them now. Um, I don't know of anything specific to the iPhone for that task. Other questions? All right. Well, I think we're out of time. But all right. Thank you so much. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.